Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Alexandra Aznar from the National Renewable Energy Lab, and I want to welcome you to today's Soul Smart webinar on solar and energy efficiency projects and programs in low and moderate income communities. Today, we have three great speakers. We'll be hearing from Chris Walker, who is the program director of Solar on Multifamily Affordable Housing at Grid Alternatives. We'll also hear from Chris Jed, the Portfolio Energy Manager at the Denver Housing Authority, and Shuba Jaijankar from the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Energy Technologies Office. After these presentations, we'll follow up with a short Q&A, and we'll be accepting questions through the questions feature on the GoToMeeting, or you can email me directly, and I will have my email momentarily. First, just a few comments about the SoulSmart program, which brings you this webinar today. SoulSmart is funded by the U.S. Department of Energy through its Solar Energy Technology Office, and it is a nationally a designation program that nationally recognizes local solar achievements and designated, designates communities um, through a three-tiered system of bronze, silver, and gold. The goal is to designate 300 communities by October 2020. And in addition to the designation, SoulSmart provides no-cost technical assistance from a team of national experts. Over 250 communities nationwide have been designated through the SoulSmart program, and those communities are in 38 states represented here on this map. If you'd like more information about the SoulSmart program and how your community can receive no-cost technical assistance on a wide range of solar issues, please see the website at the bottom, www.soulsmart.org, or please contact me directly at alexandra.asnar at nrel.gov. Again, you can submit your questions for presenters through the question feature or email me directly at my email below. All attendees are muted for this presentation. And now I'd like to pass it on to our first speaker, Chris Walker. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Walker. I'm the program director of SOMA, which is the Solar on Multifamily Affordable Housing Program at Grid Alternatives. And today I'll take you through a little bit about what GRID does in an upcoming program. So at GRID, we believe that a successful transition to clean energy must include everyone, but low-income communities are disproportionately impacted by pollution and climate change. Low-income families spend up to four times more on their energy costs as a share of their income. 31% of households face challenges when paying energy bills or adequately heating or cooling their homes. And one in five households forego necessities like food and medicine in order to pay their energy bills. When you couple that with the fact that low-income families are currently underserved by the solar industry and by energy efficiency programs, um, that sort of gives you perspective on the work that we have to do. So GRID's mission is to make renewable energy technology and job training accessible to underserved communities. So as a nation's largest nonprofit solar installer, uh, GRID provides direct solar project development and technical assistance to low-income families, provides workforce development opportunities. So all of GRID's installations um, include volunteer trainees who are learning more about solar job types and gaining experience that will help them to earn full-time jobs in the solar industry. And GRID has also established itself as a low-income solar policy expert. And since we've, um, since our founding in 2001, GRID has installed almost 12,000 systems to date for a total of about 50 megawatts, preventing 808 80,000 tons of carbon and other emissions. 
We've trained over 41,000 volunteers and we've helped low-income families save over $350 million in energy costs. So this is work that we're proud of. But today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit in more detail about in a forthcoming program called SOMA, the Solar on Multifamily Affordable Housing Program, which will launch um, just in a few short months here. So you can find out more information about SOMA at calsoma.org. But SOMA is administered not only by Grid Alternatives, but by the Center for Sustainable Energy, the California Housing Partnership Corporation, and the Association for Energy Affordability. And SOMA got its start uh, with the passage of Assembly Bill 693, which was signed in law by Jerry Brown in 2015. And it's gonna be the largest investment in providing solar to renters uh, in the nation's history. So SOMA is funded by greenhouse gas auction revenues from five investor-owned utilities that whose territories will be uh, the geographic scope of the program throughout California. And SOMA will have a budget of up to $100 million per year for 10 years with the goal of installing 300 megawatts um, and we think that'll reach approximately 4,000 um, multifamily affordable housing properties. So we're really excited about the scale of SOMA. And SOMA has sort of incorporated lessons learned from other low-income solar and energy efficiency programs that preceded it, including, including MASH, the, multi, the Multifamily Affordable Solar Housing Program, and LIWIP, the Low Income Weatherization Program. So SOMA requires that there be direct economic benefits for tenants, and that happens through virtual net energy media, net energy metering. There's a tenant engagement and education requirements so that solar isn't happening to tenants, but it's happening with their knowledge and involvement. SOMA requires workforce development opportunities for each and every installation and tenants whose properties are participating in SOMA will have the opportunity to help install solar on their own uh, rental properties. And we're doing marketing, education, and outreach um, efforts in partnership with major community-based organizations throughout the state to ensure that our marketing is culturally and linguistically appropriate to the communities we hope to serve. We also have a component uh, called an advisory council, which will be comprised of environmental justice organizations, affordable housing organizations, tenants rights groups, workforce development and labor groups and industry to keep the program administrator accountable to the communities that SOMA is intended to serve. And we'll also provide no cost technical assistance to property owners um, as sort of a bulwark for consumer protection. Um, given that the incentive will be quite juicy, uh, we will be careful to ensure that uh, the program's dollars are spent to the highest and best use. So, the, in, so SOMA is basically, basically an incentive program and it's a capacity-based incentive. So uh, the incentive amount is tied to the size of the system. Um, but we've sort of baked in some considerations that uh, change the incentive amount based on some major factors, such, such as whether the property qualifies for the investment tax credit or LIHTC, and the portion of the system serving tenants versus common areas. So given that the focus is on tenants and providing a direct uh, economic benefit to tenants, uh, property owners have a larger incentive to build out uh, systems that will serve tenant serving loads rather than common area loads. And our eligibility requirements ensure that we're serving low income communities. So the uh, multifamily affordable housing properties have to have at least five units. They have to be deed restricted, restricted with at least 10 years remaining on the property's affordable housing restrictions. They have to have separately metered units. So unfortunately, this rules out a lot of HUD, HUD properties. 
and it's only applicable to existing buildings uh, because as many of you know, um, California al already requires that uh, new construction include solar. But in addition to those requirements, 80% um, of property residents uh, must have incomes at or below 60% of the area media, median income. Uh, the property has to be located in a disadvantaged community um, that scores in the top 25% of uh, census tracts in California's Cal and Bioscreen, um, meaning these are communities that have high pollution burden uh, or other environmental factors. And it must be uh, in one of the five IOUs, uh, investor-owned utility territories, or a community choice aggregator customer in the participating utility service territory. And these, and this is sort of a map of um, our applicable uh, service areas. So again, uh, SOMA requires um, that at least 51% of uh, the electric output from solar directly benefit tenants. And that happens through VNEM. And energy efficiency is baked into SOMA as well. So to meet the energy efficiency compliance milestone, property owners have two pathways. Uh, they can hire an energy auditor or they can prove that they have recent or active participation in a energy upgrade or rehab program. But also our incentive amount takes into account easily achievable energy efficiency upgrades. We don't wanna pay incentive amounts on loads we could have prevented by um, undertaking energy efficiency improvements. But the flip side of that is that um, properties can account for load growth. Uh, if for instance, they are adding electric vehicle charging or electrifying uh, fossil, previously uh, fossil fuel powered equipment. And we'll conduct site verifications to ensure that um, documentation ma matches what's actually happening on the ground. So that wraps up a little bit about great alternatives and SOMA. And here's my contact information. I'd be happy to chat with any of you more about the program. Um, realizing that this is geared toward uh, local governments, um, we've had uh, conversations with uh, city governments already that know about SOMA and hope to replicate aspects of SOMA uh, locally. So we would um, invite your questions as well. And with that, that concludes my portion of the presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. I'm now going to turn it over to our next speaker, Chris Jed from the Denver Housing Authority. Great. Well, thanks for uh, having Denver Housing Authority on the webinar here. We're excited to be here. And I, I think over the next 10, 15 minutes, let's go over really energy efficiency um, and solar and how we, we thread that into the, the greater DHA portfolio. Um, so first, a little background DHA, we're a, a, a public housing authority, just like there are many other ones across all of this, the U.S. Um, we are a developer, owner, and operator of affordable housing. We manage over 11,000 units of housing choice vouchers, uh, as well as, as, which includes HUD projects as well. So um, and the lower right-hand side of the screen, the property characteristics. Um, this is kind of what we look at first when we look at a property for energy efficiency or retrofits or renewables. And, um, and, and the reason I bring this up is because each, not all, not all affordable housing is equal. Um, there's different programs, there's different subsidies. Um, so DHA and, and a lot of other housing authorities, they have your, your, your typical public housing. Um, and then there's the Section 8 housing, the voucher system. And then there's also project-based Section 8 um, as well as low-income housing tax credits, and then market rate. So a lot of the communities we build now, we do thread in some market rate units. So depending on what program it is and what subsidies are, are part of that property really dictates and drives how we approach a property for retrofitting or with energy efficiency, or not even retrofitting, but designing new ones. Um, and a lot of our properties and other areas as well, they, 
one building could combine a couple of these. So like one of our buildings could have a third market rate, a third light low income housing tax credit, and a third um, public housing. So there's a lot of different scenarios where um, all these are kind of intermingled. Um, and then as Chris mentioned earlier as well, the other two items we look at is who pays the utilities in terms of, you know, does, does DHA pay the utilities or do our residents pay the utilities? Um, so, you know, and then as well as the meeting, metering structure, is there one master meter or the individual meter? Because that also impacts the, the way we do it, the technologies and how we finance. So there's a lot of, a lot of things we, we look through um, to optimize and to underwrite these deals to, to make sure they're financeable and affordable. Um, and each one has its own little um, scenario of how, how we have to package the deal. So um, moving to the first slide, energy efficiency. Um, before we really put renewables on our properties, we really focus on um, efficiency and, and really lowering our energy use intensity as much as we can. And we look at this really two ways. One is our existing buildings, and the majority of our portfolio is, is older existing buildings. Um, we, you know, we're bringing on new ones as fast as we can. Uh, but the majority of it is is, is existing older structures. So uh, one really successful way, um, program we used to really drive down the energy use intensity and water consumption was through energy performance contracting. And this this is a vehicle used by you know, schools, governments. It's, it's all over the country. But HUD actually has a, a public housing energy performance contracting program, which is, is really beneficial for public housing authorities to, to really finance, energy, and water conservation, as well as capital improvements. Um, so we've done two phases of energy performance contracting. One was in 2007 with um, an energy services company, and then the second one was in 2012, where we DHA decided to do it in-house. And there's pros and cons for doing it each way, um, but e both were successful in, one, lowering our operating expenses, and two, really, you know, helping us lower our energy use intensity and becoming a more sustainable housing authority. So, so the built environment, that, that's how we drive with existing buildings. Two other big ones are um, our operations and maintenance team we really work hard with in terms of training and making sure that they have the skills and technologies to maintain all the equipment we put in. Because oftentimes right now we, we really put in a lot of fancy technology and unless the, the O&M team knows what it is, how it works, what it's doing there and, and you know how to maintain it properly, um, we'll lose those savings. So it's really important that we have continual O&M training with our maintenance team to make sure that everything we put in um, you know, lasts its effective, useful life. Um, and then last but definitely not least is, is resident engagement. Again, we could put in the fanciest systems, we could maintain them as much as we want, but if you know folks are opening their windows in the winter and running the heat, that, that doesn't help anyone. So we do a fairly robust resident engagement system or program um, working with our residents and you know incentivizing residents to save energy and, and, and different programs with them. So that's kind of the, the way we look at existing buildings. And, and then lastly, I put Energy Outreach Colorado on there. Um, and if, if for whatever reason, you know, we try to finance everything we can through energy performance contracting or other measures, but um, we do work with Energy Outreach Colorado, who's a partner with our utility Excel Energy. And they offer a lot of rebates and, and help, you know, move the needle where we can do a lot of these new retrofits, um, whether it's lighting or HVAC equipment um, within the existing portfolio. So definitely um, encourage folks to reach out to local partners that are giving rebates um, or often free uh, installs. So some of the pictures on the slide there are um, a new boiler system we put in that's uh, very efficient that was financed through an energy performance contract. And then in the lower left, um, that's, some of our maintenance staff that's getting trained up on a new um, irrigation system we have um, for landscape irrigation. So um, really put a focus on training the maintenance staff to make sure everyone's up to speed on stuff. And then moving on to new buildings, and you know we're always probably have a, a half dozen buildings in the development phase of some either design or construction. And we really push the design teams to make it as energy efficient as possible. Um, and then to top that off, we put renewables on there. And the benefits of doing it while it's under construction is, you know, you can really optimize the metering, you can make sure all the systems are, are, are complementing each other, and you can really introduce new technologies. Um, the challenge is, is financing. And oftentimes, you know, we're, we're trying to close these deals and finance the building, and, you know, we're looking for ways to, to reduce the, the construction costs. And obviously, solar is, is a quick one to take out of the program and off the budget. So, 
we do our best to, to keep that you know the solar panels on there and, and build them uh, as efficient as we can as with renewables. So that's on the energy efficiency. That's how we really work with our existing portfolio and the new buildings. Um, again, we really strive for the built environment, strive for strong O and M, and then as well as resident engagement to make sure that we're using the buildings properly too. So that is energy efficiency. Um, the other slide I wanted to share is uh, solar deployment and how we go about that. And we, since probably 2007-ish, we've we started getting more and more solar integrated into the portfolio. And we started with simply new construction installations, like I mentioned before, in terms of if we are redeveloping, let's put some solar panels on the top. Um, you know, the construction team's there, the building's being designed, everything's working. Um, so that, 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 that's the easiest way and that's what we've been doing. But then we said, hey, you know, a lot of our portfolio, majority of it is existing older buildings with a lot of cool rooftops, a lot of good rooftops. So the example is the picture in the lower left-hand corner is that's our North Lincoln Homes uh, projects or site there. And those that's an example of how we, we retrofitted over 600 homes with solar panels through a power purchase agreement. And that was really effective for DHA. We used a third party developer um, and they brought majority of the financing, majority of the expertise, the, the construction, they installed them. And so all those solar panels it equated to about 2.5 megawatts of solar across the portfolio. And it was a little out of pocket cost of DHA. And in return, we simply, we, we buy the electricity from the owner of those panels. So that's what we're focusing on um, with that program right there. So. That's the power purchase agreement. We, you know, we've done other versions of on-site solar like that, but that was a big lift for DHA to get that 666 rooftops in, in one deal. So, um, moving on is, is lastly is community solar, and this is kind of I'm really excited about this. Community, we went from rooftop solar to power purchase agreement rooftop solar, and then all of a sudden we were running out of rooftops. We, you know, a lot of rooftops are old where our properties were in the redevelopment pipeline, so we didn't want to invest in solar in them. Um, so essentially, we, we didn't have as much roof space as we wanted. And at the same time, our utility, Excel Energy, was coming out with this community solar program um, that, you know, we looked into. And so, we, you know, DHA as a housing authority said, we're committed to deploying more and more solar, and, you know, we're running out of space, so what do we do? Um, so the next step was community solar. And this, like Chris mentioned, this is, the, um, people call it different things around the country, but virtual net metering, um, net metering, um, there's different ways, but essentially the essence of a community solar garden in Colorado is it's, it's one solar array, and the, the picture of this is in the upper right-hand corner there. That, that's that's two megawatts or 10 acres of solar panels, and that, that garden, the, the, the basics is that's shared by a bunch of low-income homes and households um, within the DHA portfolio, as well as with, with uh, in addition to the DHA portfolio. So that uh, a lot of DHA properties, other housing authorities have subscribed that and essentially DHA made the decision um, to self-develop the solar garden. And, and I say self-develop, we definitely had a lot of expertise. Um, Grid Alternatives was our development partner, and so they kind of helped us navigate a lot of the policy around it. Um, but we, we found our, you know, our own lenders, our own investors. We got a contractor, and so that, what you see there is a DHA solar garden. It's called Denver Metro Solar, and it's shared by um, another housing authority and other affordable housing developers as well as low-income residents across the city and county of Denver. Um, so, and that is the model we're, we're really focusing in on now because as more and more of our rooftops are being um, redeveloped and we're, we're creating more dense buildings, which means more units under a smaller footprint, which means, you know, it's, it's tougher to get that solar deployment as, as much as you'd like to be. And so we're really turning to community solar gardens, either developing our own gardens um, and or partnering with folks like Grid or um, other solar developers to help us bring more solar online. So, so that's, um, that's kind of a, a quick overview of where we're at with energy efficiency and uh, solar and where we're headed. So I think, I think we're taking questions at the end. Yes, thank you so much, Chris. Um, and now we'll move on to our final speaker today from the U.S. Department of Energy, Shubha Shajankar. Yes, hold on, let me swap my... Okay, can you see my screen? 
Yes. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Shiva J. Shankar. I am a tech manager at the uh, Solar Energy Technologies Office here at the DOE. And I wanted to um, talk about uh, the Solar in Your Community Challenge, which is a program we've wrapped up and we are anxiously waiting to announce the winner that we're still dotting our I's and crossing our T's. And I don't know exactly when we're going to announce, but I know that it's soon. So please stay stay tuned for that. But I thought in the meantime, I would at least, you know, talk about, you know, what this program was and some key takeaways from it. So, <coughs> sorry, the um, program was launched in November of 2016. It's a $5 million prize competition that incentivized the development of new approaches to increase the affordability of electricity while also expanding solar adoption across the country. The competition really encouraged teams to expand affordable solar access for nonprofits, faith-based organizations, state and local governments, and low and moderate income communities, all of whom face you know, unique barriers to saving money on their utility bills. Um, you know, and over the past decade, solar electricity has become significantly more affordable for Americans. As you know, you're probably aware, solar energy system costs are falling and nearly 2 million systems in all 50 states are in operation. But despite these unprecedented deployment levels, the majority of Americans still don't have access to solar electricity. Um, and that's kind of where this challenge came about. Uh, we saw that many households and community organizations lack an appropriate roof, have difficulty accessing tax credits and affordable financing options, or they simply just don't have access to a solar marketplace. And so we thought at the DOE that you know new business models can overcome these challenges and can lead to a significant savings on electricity bills and increase the affordability of solar electricity for you know, the millions of Americans in this um, underserved market. And so, um, you know, a wide variety of innovative solar financing models for expanding solar access can show promise. And some examples of that include like credit enhancements, revolving funds, and all on-bill financing. And so the Solar in Your Community Challenge was designed to encourage the creation, demonstration, and scaling of new models into emerging markets to expand access to solar and create economic and job opportunities across the country. Um, so, yeah, you'll see that uh, the contest was designed such that, you know, uh, projects had to uh, have a minimum of 25 uh, kW and it says maximum of 5 megawatts. Um, over the 18 months that serve a minimum of 20% low and moderate income customers or 60% of nonprofit and local government customers. So there were two tracks that teams could take in terms of, you know, who they wanted to benefit. Um, and then um, I'm going to talk about the prize totals later, but um, essentially, you know, this was a $5 million program. So about $2 million was available in, you know, tiny um, seed awards that we were able to um, give to 34 um, teams, and then up to $2 million was available in technical support and assistance, which was, um, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it was, um, you know, um, we had this TA marketplace, um, and I'll talk about it later. Um, and then finally, $1 million in final prizes, including a $500,000 grand prize. So here's a map showing all of the participants, and you'll see it's just, you know, we're pretty much touching the entire region. There's a couple states left out, but um, I think that's really representative of the impact that solar and community solar specifically can have. So more than 170 active teams from 42 states, the District of Columbia, um, Puerto Rico, and Guam competed in this prize challenge. And so over the course of the competition, teams worked together to, um, or teams worked to, to develop and demonstrate innovative business and financial models that could expand solar access to LMI communities, nonprofits, and local governments while proving that these models could be widely replicated. Um, and, you know, teams pursued and tested a variety of emerging business models that can unlock solar access through increased affordability and lower electricity bills. Um, you know, these models, many of these models leverage the distribution networks of energy assistance programs, use donate, donation-based models 
pursue community-led cooperatives that feature return on investment for members and feature utility-led shared solar. So it really runs the gamut of like who um, who was part of these projects, like, you know, it's multi-stakeholder groups and it's just a, it's really interesting to see, you know, everything that came out of it. Next slide here. Um, this is just a uh, quick timeline, just so you folks know, you know, how we were running this. Again, I, we released it in November of 2016. Um, applications were due in March of 2017, and we actually kicked off the period of performance in May, and it went 18 months, so last October was when the period of performance ended, and then we spent, you know, all uh, winter and part of the spring um, going over the final applications and doing that whole process, and again, we are going to announce soon. I just wish I could tell you when, but I don't know. <laughs> All right. So one, um, I was me I mentioned before how there's two tracks. You could either benefit um, the LMI customers or the nonprofits, but it also there were um, teams got to self-select whether they wanted to be a project team or a program team. So to participate, you know, teams proposed to develop either new programs or a port portfolio of LMI or nonprofit projects that expand solar access in their community. Um, what that basically means is, so for projects, these were just new PV arrays that were developed, um, steel in the ground in 18 months, how much could you build and interconnect and start serving your customers? With programs, it was more um, initiatives that would enable others to develop solar. So it was basically creating um, a sustainable line of projects that could like, come online after you, you create this more overarching program. And the projects could have any team, you know, lead their, any entity lead their team, but it had to include a wide variety of partners. With programs, we really um, recommended that these teams were led by state and local governments or financial institutions or utilities because, you know, they have, I guess they there's a little more, stability in them being able to create something that is more long lasting than just a couple, not one off projects. That's not what we were looking for, but um, just to create a, a, a program of that kind of scope. Um, and so, yeah, you'll see on the bottom of the slide too, that the energy benefits must go to at least 20% LMI households or 60% of nonprofits and state and local governments. And so here is um, the uh, snapshot of what the technical assistance marketplace looked like. So um, experts from across the country also were able to participate in this challenge by providing specialized technical assistance or serving as mentors to help teams progress through the life cycle of their projects. So, you know, um, these people would apply saying, you know, I have expertise in X, Y, and Z, and, you know, we would look at their application and accept them, and then they created these storefronts, which are these little squares you'll see, and, you know, it has the type of service and it has a price, and so a team who received a technical assistance voucher, of which there were, I think, 110, they could go in and say, you know, I need help in, let's say, uh, site assessment. So they would go into the marketplace, they would type in, see who, you know, has that kind of expertise. They would then be able to talk to the certain consultant who, you know, caught their eye, be able to um, talk with them before going into any sort of agreements. If they wanted to work together, then everything happened on this platform. And once the consultant was um, finished with the product that they were going to deliver to the team, they would um, send it to the team and the team had to review it to make sure it was what they wanted. And then they would mark it as accepted. And then the consultant was able to be paid out by um, our prize administrator. So it was very um, interesting to see, um, you know, the variety of different uh, service providers that we had in this marketplace. This is just a snapshot of eight, but we had hundred, um, dozens. I don't remember the exact number of people we had, but it was, oh, it's right here. Sorry, it's three, 335 experts. Um, and there were 
some free service offerings as well, which was nice because some teams who did not receive any vouchers were not left out completely. They were still able to um, talk to some folks who were giving like, you know, one hour free sessions or they had, you know, reports and other sort of tools that they created that they were providing for free. So that was nice. Um, and then these are the final prize categories. We um, have the best LMI project and there's the grand prize and the runner up for those. Um, and then uh, best LMI program, best nonprofit project and nonprofit program. So um, you'll see that we kind of um, favored the LMI projects or the LMI in general, because I think that was the um, biggest area of most underserved community that we, you know, wanted to try and see if we could um, help. So we put a little more emphasis on that. Um, and then lastly, um, NREL recently released a report called Up to the Challenge, Communities Deploy Solar in Underserved Markets. And there, the um, underlined word for report there, that's a hyperlink. But uh, if you Google that title, you should be able to find it because they just posted a few days ago. Um, and so there's some key takeaways that I wanted to, to share. Um, there was almost an even split between um, for-profit and nonprofit led teams, which I found interesting. And there's um, plenty of teams that were also led by local governments. Um, you know, in terms of siting, they found that municipal buildings, single family homes and nonprofits were the most common. Um, and then they found that there was a variety of financing mechanisms used in projects. And some examples of that are donations and crowdfunding, grants, debt, tax equity, and the use of PPAs. And then through the TA marketplace, they saw that teams needed the most help with system design, financing, customer acquisition and marketing, and policy and regulatory issues. And then one other um, little cool nugget that came out of that report says if um, if all the teams were to successfully execute their business plans, which is in the beginning when they were accepted, you know, we asked them a series of questions of, you know, what are your goals? And so if they were able to execute those business plans, the Solar New Community Challenge um, is expected to generate 1.6 gigawatts of solar by 2020, serving as many as 900 nonprofits and 48,000 LMI households. Now, of course, that's not all going to come to fruition, but I think that's like really great that all these entities have these lofty goals and um, are working, are trying to work really hard to, you know, meet those. So um, you can read more about the um, so on your community challenge and some read some case studies as well on about nine or 10 teams in this report. With that, if you have more questions, uh, you can contact me. This is my email address. Um, if you forget it, you can always um, email someone um, from this webinar and they will be able to put you in contact with me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shuba. And thank yeah. you to all of our presenters today. We do have a few um, questions from the audience. So the first one is for Chris Jed at DHA. Chris, you had mentioned that one of your pillars for your energy efficiency projects is resident engagement. And I was wondering if you could share an example or a few of those kinds of engagement activities you do to um, help residents understand energy use more both on the efficiency side and then how you also engage residents to be interested in your community solar offerings. Yeah, so on the efficiency side or where we're, you know, our residents are in the units and we're doing efficiency upgrades, we, we did a pilot program a few years back where we, we tested a, a bunch of different actions or, or activities that residents could do um, to save energy, electricity, gas, or water. And they were, you know, everything from, you know, maybe we, we came up with a list of like, you know, 30, taking shorter showers, turning your lights off, turning your appliances off, air drying your clothes and whatnot. And then we, we kind of looked at all those and said, okay, well, we, we weighed them on three criteria. One is the impact of energy or water conservation. Two is the likelihood of them being adopted. And then three is, you know, how long will they, you know, will it, how long will they do it essentially? So we kind of, and we worked with our residents a lot of it was 
you know, due to the success of all the resident engagement that is part of the pilot, that, you know, some resident says, yes, yeah, I, I would take shorter showers. Some residents are like, no way, I wouldn't take shorter showers. Um, so essentially we, we tested a bunch. This is over a couple of years and figuring out which had the most impact, which didn't, which were winners, which were losers. Um, and then we, we took the, some of the winners and, and rolled them out across the portfolio through um, campaigns and we go to the local resident councils, which is essentially equivalent to you know, a, a RNO meeting. Or um, so each property has a local resident council meeting. So we 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 reach out to the residents as much as we can, either through flyering um, or through the meetings, like I mentioned, um, to kind of or through their utility bills. So a lot of residents have excess utility bills or charges, and you know we we send in mailers, or we 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 stuff the bills with flyers and stuff like that. So. Um, we did find that, you know, some of the, the, the top winners of that pilot program we, we held a couple of years back was one is reporting leaks. Um, water's, you know, there's leaks all over the portfolio in terms of leaky toilets or, you know, leaky faucets. And, um, you know, a lot of times we, those leaks aren't reported on time. And so, you know, a lot of residents were like, yeah, we could pick up the phone and call for a leak. And so we really hammer home on, on water and water conservation with leaks. So if your toilet's leaking, um, you know, let us know if your sink is leaking or, you know, your faucet drips, let us know. And that has been really successful um, with one, fixing leaks, but two, you know, making it a healthier place to live because there's no mold issues and, it, um, you know, it, you, you don't want leaky pipes in your in your unit. So it really shored up the portfolio um, and saved a lot of uh, water and money with the leaks is a, is a great example. Um, another one is appliances. A lot of um, residents thought, you know, yes, they could turn off their appliances. One, it helps save energy, but two, it helps prolong the life of the appliances for them. Um, and so that, that's another successful one, too. But essentially, we, we you know, we go out and um, we reach out to the residents as much as you can. It is challenging, though, know, because, you know, the impact, is, you know, to, to do the measurement and verification on the impact is, is pretty difficult, um, mainly because there's a lot of moving pieces in the equation for it. Um, but we, we do the best we can to, to reach out and do as much as we can with that. And then as far as the community solar garden reaching out to our residents, a majority of our residents don't pay their utility bills. Um, they're paid by DHA and then they either, depending on if, if it's master metered, then they don't know how much energy they're using. But if it isn't master metered, they sometimes get excess utility charters. But for the residents that do pay their utility bills, we reached out to all of them and said, hey, well, DHA has this solar garden and, and that's where we, um, you know, we, we help them fill out the forms from our utility and then they become eligible to be um, subscribers to that solar garden. Great, thank you so much for that, Chris. Mm -hmm. We have another question, this time for Chris Walker. Um, Chris, you mentioned in your presentation that there's a variety of eligibility criteria for the SOMA program, and we're wondering if you anticipate uh, demand that will sort of outpace the availability of, of the program? And if so, are, do you have other methods for prioritizing who receives um, the benefits? Yep, so there are a number of eligibility criteria and project um, milestones that um, folks submitting reservations have to meet. Um, so the queue is roughly organized in first come, first served, um, order, but um, projects will sort of lose their place in line if they fail to meet certain criteria. And um, one thing I failed to mention is that the incentive amount will sort of taper each year um, based on NREL's report on the cost of solar or 5%, whichever is, is greater. So we expect our opening project year to be uh, the, the biggest in terms of uh, reservation requests because the incentive amount will be the highest in the first year. Um, so given that each uh, investor-owned utility will have its own budget tied to uh, the greenhouse gas auction revenues uh, that are raised in that utility territory, um, the wait lists will sort of organize themselves accordingly based on that year's greenhouse gas uh, auction revenue budget and uh, the incentive amount and the claims that sort of come in um, as the program progresses. So 
Um, we actually believe we'll have a hard time meeting our 300 megawatt target, uh, given that um, master meter properties are not currently eligible. So one of the things that we're doing behind the scenes before the program launches, for instance, is working with HUD to figure out uh, what some eligibility requirements would be uh, for master metered properties um, that could play out in a manner where we could ensure a direct economic benefit to tenants who, although they don't pay their own electricity bill, those costs are sort of rolled up um, into one sort of housing and utility costs. Um, so we're navigating that. And again, we have to uh, probably install on 4,000 properties over the course of the 10 years. So using MASH, the Multifamily Affordable Solar Housing Program, as sort of a bellwether, we think these will be 80 kilowatt projects on average. Um, so uh, based on our analysis of of the housing stock and potentially eligible properties, we'll need to expand eligibility to meet our goals. Thank you. And um, Chris, we have a kind of a follow-up question about the SOMA program, and that is if other states are interested in creating a program modeled after SOMA, what criteria would make the state eligible to succeed, or what sort of foundation would they need to, to be successful with such a program, in your opinion? Sure, so I think among um, sort of the lessons learned that SOMA is implementing based on um, our experience with MASH and LIWIP, we think it's really critical to not only ensure that there's a direct economic benefit to tenants, but sort of mandate that. So um, one of the things that we're doing is we're making property owners um, sign a legally binding affidavit uh, that says that they won't raise rent um, as a result of the SOMA installations. So I think that not only creating eligibility criteria that encircle the communities uh, that you'd like to see impacted, um, in our case, those are communities that have high pollution burdens or, or low income um, based on area median income, I think those are good starting places. But uh, depending on, on your will and what you would like to do with it, I also believe that uh, SOMA's workforce components are critical. Um, but none of this happens without some form of virtual net metering or, or another means of ensuring that you know, the savings get gets passed along to the renters themselves. So I think that's the fundamental nut to crack. Um, the five IOU territories in which we'll work haven't all cracked that nut. So um, unfortunately, we're sort of in a situation of, of building those systems as we fly in partnership with uh, all of those utilities. Uh, but um, just taking a step back, uh, funding is critical. Not every state has a cap and trade program. Um, obviously, this is an expensive effort, but um, one of the things that led to its creation was um, the honest acknowledgement that without an incentive program or, or something similar or some, some grant funding, uh, these sorts of initiatives don't really happen by themselves out in the marketplace. Um, so we hope to begin to change that. Um, the cost of solar is falling and that helps, uh, but still you have to address address the fundamental issue with uh, the lack of financial incentive for property owners to reduce their uh, tenants' energy costs. So that's a fundamental hump to get over, in my opinion. Thank you for that thorough answer. Um, we have a question for you, Shula, at DOE, and that is, You'll be soon making the announcement of the Solar in Your Community Challenge winners. Do you anticipate another round of the program that can build off of some of the lessons learned that you've learned that are highlighted in that report? Yeah, we're definitely thinking about it and we're trying to, you know, do our strategic planning, but we don't have anything set in stone yet. So that's another one of those. Stay tuned and we'll make some sort of announcement if we are doing something uh, as a follow on. 
Okay, thank you. And I think our final question we have today is again for Chris Jed at DHA. Chris, you mentioned that you um, anticipate that community solar model is going to be really significant going forward for your your goals, and we're wondering, are there additional solar energy efficiency goals DHA has to expand its impact for residents? Um, is it, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in general, our goal is to get as much solar out there as possible, and then, you know, so there's two twofold here. One, there's two answers to that question. One is the solar part, and one is the impact to the residents. Um, regarding the solar, you know, we're, we're aggressively looking at partnering with other developers as well as in-house development of more solar gardens as moving forward, both for the existing portfolio as well as, you know, the new developments coming online and new new neighborhoods we're working in um, as well. So that, that's kind of on the environmental side. On the, the resident impact side of that question, um, we are, and, you know, Chris was talking about this too, is there's different utility allowances and, and different policies depending if it's public housing or LIHTC housing or master meter or not. So we're also working to try to figure out, you know, how residents, because ultimately you want to do solar because one, it's good for the environment, but two, it saves money. And so how can that money savings, uh, you know, thread back to the residents if they do not pay their um, um, utility bills and, and what that looks like and, and or if they don't get the money directly, how can they get it indirectly and really um, benefit the residents in terms of, you know, programs um, and, and other supportive services. So we're definitely working on that of how, how we take that, the, the savings part and, and translate that into residential benefits, whether they pay the bills or don't pay the bills. And like Chris said, it's kind of a new frontier and there's different policies and, um, you know, some are more friendly than others in terms of making that happen, but um, we're trying to navigate through that as well. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today. Um, that concludes the end of this webinar. Those who did sign up, uh, re a recording of the webinar will be provided to participants. So expect that soon in your inbox. And once again, thank you to all of our presenters today. And please follow up um, with me if you have any questions. Goodbye. <laughs>